لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum, which means peace be unto you. Welcome to another episode of The Dean Show. We're trying to humbly help you understand Islam and Muslims. Today, we're going to be talking about a very important topic. This is something now that is on some of the minds of the more serious people in life. People who have went through some of the things in life that many people go through, parties, being invited to some of the big social gatherings and being around maybe some of the celebrities and you know what, they still haven't figured out the purpose of life and now they're thinking and contemplating and getting a little more serious. They want to get serious in life but now there's one hurdle. There's so many different ways out there. You got Tom Cruise calling you to Scientology. You got these people calling you to Christianity and Buddhism and this ism and that ism. How do you know which is the correct way, the religion, the way of life, the system that God Almighty wants you to live? We're going to be talking about that when we come back here on The Dean Show. You don't go nowhere. Allah, there's only one God and Jesus was his messenger. Allah, la ilaha illallah. I don't know why I did that. Maybe it's just, maybe it's just to break the ice. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. How you doing, brother? Very good, very good. You heard me introduce it. Yes. And I introduced you in another show, so we're not going to waste a lot of time there. You are from the Baina Institute. You know the Arabic? That's the original language that the Quran was revealed in. You know how to speak it. I'm a student of it, yes. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Okay, you know some Arabic. We're good. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, look, we're breaking a little bit of the ice, but this is serious. The guy's been to all the clubs. He's had all the girls, but he sees there's something missing. There's a void. Mm -hmm. She's been hustled, and she's made a little money, and she's sick of being used and abused and all this stuff, and people are ready to get serious. Yeah. You know what? But there's a lot of things out there, a lot of confusion for some people. How do they find out what is... They're smart enough to know, look that there is a creator. But how is it that there's so many different ways and which is the correct one? Talk to us. Hmm. First, let's walk through the thought process of someone who comes to the right conclusions. <clears throat> they already recognize that this world was not created without a purpose. Mm -hmm. That, you know, the intricate creation of even ourselves down to our very fingertips is something very profound and amazing. So it couldn't be that this has been designed without, a, without a, an agenda, no a way. cause, a purpose. No way. They acknowledge that there's a creator who designed this in such perfection. Mm -hmm. And any decent human being, one characteristic of decency is gratitude. Mm -hmm. When somebody does you a favor, it's human decency that you want to thank them. It would be very indecent and inappropriate of you that you had a flat tire, somebody came and helped you out, and you just turned the other way and walked away. Or, or drove off. That's just rude. It's just, it's not appropriate. It's, yeah. not, it's not common decency. Not at all. And human beings have a sense of common decency across religions and culture. Absolutely, yeah. So when you realize there's a creator, you realize that he's created you in such a powerful way, and he's given you abilities that he hasn't given other creatures. Yeah. And he's given you, uh, you know, uh, all of these faculties, not just your physical faculties, which are amazing enough. Like none of us paid for our eyes, and none of us, you know, bought our hands anywhere. They were just given to us. And there are so many others that don't have these things. So you, you, one acknowledges, first of all, that these things were given to him or her without them having to pay for them. And then on top of that, their sustenance, water, the air they breathe, the, the, the family they enjoy, the house, whatever they may have. Mm -hmm. is just, they've been poured upon from every direction with all sorts of favors, none of which they had to pay for. It was just kind of handed down to them. So the very least decent person well, in some way in their mind, they want to be grateful. So even you'll find the people that aren't very religious, if they win the championship, you know, they'll say, I thank God. Yeah. Right? There's some sense of decency, right? But in, in addition, there's also a sense of appreciation. In uh -huh. addition to praise, yeah. or, uh, or rather gratitude, there's praise and appreciation. Meaning he didn't just help us, he helped us in such a profound way. And his creation and his creative power is so incredible. Just the vastness of this universe, if you ever ponder over that. Just look at the sky one day and just look at its flawless end to end. 
uh, that in itself would make you in awe of the creative power of this one creator. We're not even going to name him yet. Uh -huh. We acknowledge then that this creator who made me, who has a purpose, well, who who's the, the best person or the best individual or entity rather that can tell me my purpose? Think about this. If I made this cup, yeah. well, I made it for a purpose. The, the, the manufacturer of something manufactures something for a reason. You make a car so it drives. You build a house to live in. Right? So when human beings construct something, design something, then there's a purpose in mind for which they're designed. So when you acknowledge there's a creator and he created me and he created me quite well with this profound intellect that he gave me and all these faculties and abilities, then what purpose do I have? Where am I going to find my purpose? Well, you go back to the manufacturer. You go back to the creator mm -hmm. to find your purpose. You can't figure it out yourself. You have to ask him because he's the one who designed you. So you acknowledge that you are actually, you are uh, this Lord that's over you, the one who's been providing for you and sustaining you and taking care of you, just like he's the Lord of everyone else, mm -hmm. he's the only one that can dictate your purpose. But you also come to another really powerful conclusion, that up until now in your life, maybe you're 20, 25 years old. For 25 years in your life, you didn't live up to your purpose because you didn't even know what it was, right? So you've been in violation of your purpose. Now let's take a step back. If you have, you know, if I own a computer and it doesn't do what I want it to do, right? It crashes. Mm -hmm. I can chuck it out. I can throw it away. I own it. I bought it for a purpose. It didn't fit that purpose, so I got rid of it. Back in the old days, some farmer gets a cow, right? A cow stops giving milk. He got it for the purpose of milk. It stops giving milk. What does he do? He slaughters the cow. Yeah. But you come to the conclusion that you were created for a purpose. You, there's a Lord over you who expects that you live up to your purpose. But for these 25, 20, 19, 18, whatever years of your life, you've been violating that purpose because you didn't even know there was a purpose. You didn't even acknowledge it. But did he punish you for it? Is it, for example, one of your purposes, one, one thing under your purpose is not to lie, for example. Every time you lied, was there lightning that struck from the sky and cut your tongue off? Or every time you stole, did your hand just fall off? Or every time you, you know, engaged in something evil, something wrong, did you punish, experience the punishment right away? No. He let you go. He let it slide. He keeps letting it slide. And human beings aren't like that. You know, when we expect something from someone, like an employee, yeah. right? If, you, if I hired you to be my accountant, and I expect you to show up at 9 o'clock, and you don't show up for four weeks, and then you show up the, you know, after, at the fifth week at you know, 3 p.m., uh -huh. and say, Where, you know, where's my paycheck? Then you've already been fired, right? So you acknowledge you've been in violation and this Lord of yours is far more merciful than anyone else you've ever experienced. His mercy is unimaginable. His mercy is unimaginable. But then you also realize as unimaginable as his mercy is, if I've come to this conclusion that I don't know my purpose or I haven't sought out my purpose and I've been getting away with it all this time, is it okay if I should just forget about this purpose and continue to not think about this anymore and move on? But, or if, I, if I've reached, if I've come this far in my thought, then I should realize that he knows that I've come to this conclusion. He knows that I realized I should be looking for my purpose. Mm -hmm. So if I stop my search here and say, ah, I'm thinking too deep, better go back to the life of partying, then there will be consequences. I will have to pay for everything that I did. Mm -hmm. So once this, you reach this thought process up to here, now what's the next step? You turn to this creator, this mysterious creator that you don't yet know, and you declare one thing to him. I acknowledge that you're my creator. I acknowledge that I'm supposed to be in service to you. Whatever I do in this life is supposed to live up to your purpose that you set for me, but I cannot fulfill that purpose on my own because I don't know where to start. You need guidance. I, I, don't, need, I don't have anything. So even if I want to serve you, mm -hmm. how am I going to do so unless you help me? Yeah. Unless you help me. So, so far you would mean the thought process. Gotcha. First there was appreciation. Then there was his amazing mercy that he let you slide so far. Then there was the idea that there's going to be consequence, so you better get your act together. Mm -hmm. Then there's the idea that you ask him, you, you, I'm going to worship you. I want to turn to you. I want to give myself up to you, we need direction, but I no. need your help. We need direction. We need direction. So now when you ask him for direction, you ask him for guidance. Mm -hmm. You ask him for the way, the clear, straight way that to go to live your life. But you also come to another conclusion. If in fact he is as merciful, if, and if, if in fact this is the truth, then you can't be the only one. This must have happened before you. There must have been people before 
that asked for this guidance, uh -huh. sincerely. And there must be people before that were given this guidance, yeah. right? So you ask him, instead of being left out in the, on your own, you ask him to show you a path that other people have already walked. Uh -huh. People have already got, and that he favored upon, right? And then there must be other people who asked for that path. <clears throat> now listen to this carefully. They asked for that path. They got the path. It's like me asking you for directions. You gave me directions. But I didn't follow those directions, right? I didn't follow those directions. You, that's such a person who asks for the favor, gets the favor, and then disregards the favor, is someone who the Creator must be very angry with. You know, there's a person who didn't even get the favor. But there's a person who got the favor and then disregarded it. Uh -huh. Saw the truth and then put it aside. This person is worthy of the Lord's wrath. And then finally, there's a person who asked, who asked for the favor, got that favor, received that favor, but then mixed his own thoughts and desires into that favor. Mm. God gave him guidance, he gave him the truth, he gave him clarity, but he didn't like everything that he heard. So he put something of his own in there and became lost. Mm -hmm. Now this thought process that I've explained to you actually, the reason I went in this route is because this is the thought process of the Qur'an, the first surah. The first surah of the Qur'an is actually the thought process of someone seeking the truth. Uh -huh. We say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, the first thing. Yeah. Praise and gratitude belong to Allah, the Lord of all the peoples of the worlds. Yeah. All the worlds, okay? So we talked about praise and gratitude. Mm -hmm. Then we say, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, the unimaginably, exceedingly merciful, constantly merciful. Uh -huh. So this was the mercy part. But then we say, Maliki Yawmiddin, the master of the day of judgment. There's going to be consequence if I, look, if I try to take advantage of his mercy. Yeah. Then we talked about you reaching the conclusion you want to worship him. Iyaka mm na'budu, -hmm. we worship only you. But we can't worship him ourselves, we, have, we need help. So, Iyaka nasta'inu, we seek your help. We seek your help. What help specifically do we seek? Guide us. So what's the next ayah? Ihdina sirat al-mustaqim. Guide us to and along the straight path. Then we said, this path must not be us alone. There are people that have gone down this road before. So we asked to find the road of those who have succeeded before us, the path of those who you favored, not those who earned your wrath, not those who went astray. Mm -hmm. Right. So this thought process is what we are asking people to consider. It's universal. I didn't take you to the Qur'an first. I showed you the logic of that path first. Right. Yeah. Once you understand this path, nothing I have said is directly saying except Islam. Mm -hmm. All we're saying is be sincere to the Creator, be grateful to Him, accept Him as your Lord, ask Him to show you the path sincerely, and ask Him to show you those who walked down this path before and succeeded, and keep you away from those who walked down this path but then got lost, then went astray, or earned God's wrath, earned Allah's wrath, right? Now for people who are seeking this truth, what is the measuring stick? The first measure is your own conscience. Uh -huh. That's the first measure. The second measure is, if in fact it is from God, uh -huh. then it has to meet one primary standard. And that primary standard is, there can be no one between me and the worship of that one true God. Nobody in the middle. No, nobody in the middle. There can be those who show me that path. Uh -huh. But I'm not going to worship these people that are showing me the path. I'm only going to take their teachings to get to the path. Because they may be the ones Allah favored. Just like I asked to show me some role models, some guides. Yeah. So these are people that are role models, not ones to be worshipped, but rather to be looked at as role models, yeah. as guides. So this sincere attitude, this measuring stick, with, 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 with this standard, when you try to seek a path, and you try to filter out what is it that's out there, what are the things that are peop people are calling towards, and you find, and then in that quest, when we ask you humbly to consider, just sincerely look at Islam, yeah. sincerely look at the Quran, what is it asking you to do? What is it asking you for? What is it demanding from people? You will find it's essentially saying one thing. We created you for a purpose. Right? And Allah says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجَنَّةِ وَالْإِنسِ إِلَّا يَعْبُدُونَ We didn't create gender human beings except that they should worship me. What's the we here when you say we? So people are... Well, actually, in that specific ayah, it's I. Yeah. Actually, خَلَقْتُ I, I didn't create. But uh, in the Qur'an, we is used as a royal we. What that means it's is... Not some, uh, some people might think, because uh, they might come over from a Christian background mm -hmm. and they say Trinity, does it have anything to do no, with... No, to understand that better, in the Qur'an, uh, when God is exceptionally merciful or angry, 
he says I. Put the analogy, even though there's no parallel to Allah, but in language, if you think of a king, yeah. right? Uh, a king normally speaks of himself in royal terms. Uh -huh. We have declared, this is our land. I see, I see. You know? Yeah. Um, you know, so and, and come and kneel before us, mm -hmm. right? So the, the king speaks of himself in royal terms, and this is very true in Semitic culture, and Arabic yeah. is a Semitic language. But when the king is exceptionally angry, like some guy comes up to him and talks to him in a disrespectful way, you dare speak to me like this? He goes from we to what? Me, mm -hmm. right? So the, the singular I is used in the Quran in cases of anger, yeah. and also in cases of mercy. Uh -huh. But in, in, in when, whenever Allah is talking about his royalty, his majesty, his kingship, his dominion, his provision, these grand things, then you will find the word we. So it's not in the literal sense, it's in the sense of royalty. And other proof that it's not literally we, is that the Quran uses the word he for God. Yeah. Hua, he. But there's no mention of they. You see, I and we is first person, right? But he is third person. So if this was truly plural, we would find plural in the third person too. Okay, so this is the... One God, not the three in one God, absolutely one God who created all of us. And this is the God that we need to ask for guidance, as you were saying. Absolutely. How do we get people to see the urgency of this? Some people say, you know what, I'll wait until I, uh, you know, I'm question. 40, 50, when I get a little gray hair. I still got some time. I want to chase the girls. I want to, you know, look good for the boys. I want to hang out. Is this a good thing mm. that people are doing? Delaying? We'll be right back. You have to pray as if everything depends on Allah and it does. But you must work as if everything depends on you and it doesn't. That's my point. You see what I'm saying? And I don't like that. I don't like us sitting here. What are you waiting for? What are we waiting for right now? What are we waiting for all these people to come to Islam? What are we waiting for? What are we waiting for right now? When they're going to come? They're going to come to Allah and bring these people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in our hand the ability to do it. Now do your job. You know, from the Islamic point of view, yeah. all human beings are rich in one asset, mm -hmm. time. Okay. The sick, the healthy, the man, the woman, the, the, you know, the, the, the wealthy, the poor, the educated, the uneducated, everybody has one thing that they have some authority over, uh -huh. is time. Now, that time is constantly being taken away from us. Our bodies are withering, mm -hmm. slowly but surely. We're maturing, we can't help our growth. And as we're getting older, our bodies are decaying and we can't help that. We can't stop it. Yeah. We can slow it down if we try, uh -huh. but we can't stop it. Yeah. And we're all running in this stream of time. Nobody can run backwards. Everybody's headed forwards. <laughs> you are marching forward. You know, it's like the imagery of, you know, those escalators. You're standing on it. You, there's no going back. You just got to keep going straight forward, forward, forward. Now Allah swears by that time that you and I are running out of. And He says one thing. No doubt every single human being is drowning in loss. So now think about this. Allah's this the Quranic view, the Islamic view for all human beings. I don't care if you're rich or poor, wealthy or not, famous or not, you know, healthy or not, doesn't matter. All human beings, no matter what their worldly life is like, no matter how much they think they're enjoying themselves, the Quran says they are drowning in loss. To help you understand this imagery, I know, I mean, I, when I explain this to children, I use this imagery because it helps a lot. Imagine that you're drowning, mm -hmm. but you're asleep, you're, sub, you're unconscious, yeah. you're drowning. What is the, f first of all, do you have a lot of time no. when you're drowning and you're, you're unconscious? You don't have a lot of time. Time's a big asset here. Yeah. So you got to take care of business immediately. But what is the first thing you have to do to have any hopes of saving yourself? For a person who's subconscious and drowning, what's the first step? They have to wake up. Mm -hmm. If they don't wake up, there's no discussion of anything else, you gotta right? Wake up, yeah. You got to wake up. Now imagine that your dream is life is good. It's all great. Everything around you is wonderful. You're partying, you're living it up. You've got all the time in the world, but that's a dream. Wake up. Reality is yeah. you're actually drowning. Yeah. Now, when you when you're drowning and you wake up, let's say you do wake up. And you realize, in fact, that you are drowning, that mm -hmm. that was a dream. This is reality. The reality is actually unseen, and what you see around you is deception, right? When you come to that conclusion, then necessarily the person who's drowning, whether they know how to swim or not, they're going to try to flap their limbs and try to get out of the water. They're going to do whatever in their capacity. 
We said in the beginning discussion, the person who truly seeks guidance says, I want to worship you. I want to do something. I don't know what to do. Show me what to do to how to get out of this water. Mm -hmm. Right? So this person starts, you know, flapping away, trying to get out of this water. But this attempt to get out of your drowning state will not happen unless you do one thing first. You wake up. What do you wake up to? What's the reality? That time is running out. That is the ultimate loss of all human beings is time. And people who think they have all the time in the world. And you know, you know, Allah speaks of this. He's, he, you know, there's a person whose attitude is, يَحْسَبُ أَنَّ مَا لَهُ أَخْلَدَ He thinks his money is going to give him eternal life. He thinks his money is going to last him forever. You know, there are people who will build their house and mansion and they'll reach an age where they can't even walk from one room to the other without help. How, who's enjoying that mansion? Mm -hmm. yeah, right? So there, there's this false hope that this world brings with it yeah. and people get completely sucked into it and forget to open their eyes. Their, the dream is too sweet. The dream is too sweet. So if, you, if for a moment your eyes have opened, don't let them shut again. Don't let them shut again. The last thing I'll say about this, which is really important, uh -huh. is uh, there's a poet who gives an analogy of this reality. I mean, think about it. We are saying that all human beings are running out of time and they better get their act together. Unless, uh, and otherwise they're in real serious trouble. But do you see that trouble? No. Uh -huh. We can't see it with our eyes. It's only going to be visible to you as soon as your eyes close forever. Yeah. You go into that ground and now you'll see what you did, right? But for now you don't see it. Yeah. For now you don't see it. So the poet complains, he says, I'm in the middle of the ocean, I'm hanging on to a raft, and it's raining. And I'm being expected not to get wet. And let me tell you what the poet's actually talking about. The poet is talking about us living in this world as soon as you step out of your house, as soon as you flip on the TV or surf the web, there are things that you're bombarded with that you want. Car, house, girls, men, whatever it may be, right? Mm -hmm. Different desires are being pushed and blasted to you. Billboards everywhere, ads everywhere, you know, the talk of money and what to do with it and what to get and what not to get and career and this and that. You're constantly being blasted with what you want to get. Yeah. And you, people are convincing you that this is success. If you have this, you will have success. Tell me something. If you are in a room that is on fire, or you're drowning, and somebody comes and talks to you about what kind of car you want to get, or what kind of house you want to live in, or w when are you going to get your next promotion? Doesn't that sound crazy? Yeah. Before you talk about success, you have to talk about survival, right? Yeah. We are saying, Yes, we want you to succeed. But before the discussion of success even becomes relevant, you have to make sure you're doing what? Surviving. Mm -hmm. That's the Qur'an's picture. And what I, what the imagery I just shared with you is actually from Surah Al-Asr. You know, uh, Allah swears by time, all human beings are drowning in loss, except those who believe. Believing is like waking up yeah. and, and do righteous deeds. And then it goes on, and that may be another discussion, what they do next after that. We're almost out of time. Give us, the people, the people who are watching, who are sincere, who are honest with themselves. And you know what? You gave them that first thing that they can do is ask the Creator alone for that guidance, for the instructions on how to live their lives. Give us some more of a formula that people can follow to find the truth and to be on the truth. Hmm. First of all, I mean, we did allude to time just a few minutes ago. This search and this effort takes time. You have to sincerely put time into doing this. You have to take yourself away from the distractions and delusions that uh, take you away from this quest. And sincerely, you, you have to look at um, an, another dimension of a formula, if, if you will, is a kind of religion in which, in its text, in its sacred literature, there are s some obvious things aren't there. Or what are some obvious things? Racism injustice against people, tyranny, oppression, right? These things aren't there from the very get-go, you know? And there, there isn't some like dark history that, you, you know, that, that comes with that religion and people are saying, yeah, it's there, but it's not that big of a deal. No, you, it has to be a religion that appeals to your human decency. Yeah. And this is what we're arguing the Qur'an is. Nowadays, in Islam, there's a lot of propaganda about, you know, um, certain misconceptions that are highlighted and propagated. 
My claim with full confidence is every one of those allegations that are made of Islam being inhumane or being intolerant or anything else, if you study them with sincerity and if they're presented properly to you without any watering down, in, in their true in, uh, honesty, I don't see any decent human being would say this doesn't make sense. They would say it makes sense. Because what God reveals is better for us and it appeals to our human decency. And this is the essence of the matter. But in the end, my final advice would be, uh, and this is the last part of it, if you sincerely ask for guidance, be ready for what you get. You, it may not be something you like, you may have to give up your desires for it. Because you're not the one in, uh, in the position of making demands. He's the one who places the demands, you accept them. Don't think of religion as, why is God not telling me what I want to hear? Why, isn't, why don't I have to do what I, why don't I get to do what I want to do? It's not about you. You've already acknowledged you owe Him gratitude. He doesn't owe you anything. So be sincere and submissive in your search. So when you find the truth, you submit to it. You put your ego before it. And you, 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 you put it on the ground, basically. And you give in to the, the Lord of the Worlds. Thank you very much. Jazakallah Haida. And we hope to see you back here again on the Dean Show. And we like to thank you for sitting tight through another episode of the Dean Show. I hope you got to benefit. He has given us the formula. It's very simple. Ask the one who created you to guide you and be ready to submit to what he tells you to do. It's very simple. And come back here every week on the Dean Show. We look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, assalamu alaikum. Peace be unto you. I just want to say, very simple message. He is the maintainer. One of the, the beautiful preserver. things about our religion of Islam he is the, the emphasis on direct he ritual and prayer to God directly. Is the there is no intermediary. The lights will go on after the party and the party will end. It's very simple and very clear. There are no superstitious rituals, no strange incantations. Time is running out. We might not make it till tomorrow. And this is something that we need to think about. It's cold, it's late, everybody's sleeping. I arise and ask Allah to forgive me. Oh Allah, you see, oh Allah, you know all the sins I do. I turn to you to forgive my sins and my heart. I'm your sinful slave, you're my loving Lord, I'm the one who runs away, oh Allah guide me.